Hello there, it's James B. Welcome to my vodcast. It is Friday, and that means another great interview. This time, Ernesto Cervini is my guest. I promised he'd be my guest last week, but now I mean it. He's here, and he's going to tell us all about being a musician, working in the music industry. He's with Orange Grove Publicity, uh, and raising a family. Man, this guy is so busy. So we'll talk to him in a moment. This time I mean it. Uh, but first, I want to thank everybody who supports this vodcast. If you are a Patreon supporter of mine, thank you so much. If you're not, you could be. Five bucks a month, US. Um, and uh, you can just do that at patreon.com. Thank you to Barbarian Steakhouse. Mm -mm, it's good in there. I like to have meetings there. In fact, coming up in a little while, I'll be interviewing some people in their wine cellar. Their $2 million wine cellar with about $10 million of wine inside something else. Uh, and thank you to Paul Barber, barberfinancial.com. If you need help with your finances and it's the new year, you might want to think about doing 2020, right? Talk to Captain Paul. Tell him James B sent you. Okay, here are the clubs. I love all clubs. Now, I'm working at Jazz Bistro. I've been booking that club. It's booked up till about June right now, uh, but I support every venue that pays musicians fair, and these four clubs support me, and I support them, and we all support music. So please get out there and support music. In January, tonight, Homesmith Bar Old Mill Inn, Colleen Allen is performing. Man, she's got a great band. Rob Pilch on guitar, George Kohler on bass, Ethan Ardelli on drums. She is such a multi-instrumentalist. She'll mostly be playing saxophones, maybe a clarinet, but sometimes she'll pick up an accordion. She might sing. Anything could happen with Colleen Allen. She is so loved in Toronto. And if you haven't seen her, you better get down there. 7.30 to 10.30 at the Homesmith Bar Old Mill Inn. Saturday, Luanda Jones is going to be singing and her mom from Rio de Janeiro. Yes, all the way from Brazil, Irenia Maria Ribeiro, and she's performing with uh, Ezequiel Sila on bass and my old buddy Gord Sheard on piano. He spent so much time in Brazil learning about the culture and all the different musical styles. He's a genius, and you're going to see the four of these people having a lot of fun tomorrow night. Wednesday the 22nd, John McMurchie with his band. John McMurchie, a great composer, great sax player too, but what a composer. Uh, and Bob DeAngelis is there on Thursday the 23rd, so you've got a lot of fun at the Homesmith Bar Old Mill Inn. All shows 7.30 to 10.30, no cover, $20 minimum. Yep, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Lula Lounge, Martin, Elena, and Salsa Star are there tonight with uh, DJ Suave. As I always say at Lula Lounge, Bring some dancing shoes. Whether you know how to salsa or not, you're going to want to get up on that dance floor at some point. The live music there is so much fun. Saturday, Richard Barboza is there with DJ Santiago Valasquez. Uh, and Thursday, a tribute to Etta James. At last, there's a tribute to Etta James. Uh, Hughes Room Live, tribute to Van Morrison. Holy tributes, Batman. Uh, Van Morrison tribute tonight. Uh, tomorrow, a, a James Taylor tribute called Sweet Baby James. It's the sixth time they've done this. And uh, Michael Rycraft, that beautiful man who makes CD covers for people. He's a graphic designer, got a ton of Junos for, writing, for creating these amazing CD covers. He's also a producer, and he's producing this show, a tribute to James Taylor. Uh, on the 19th, Ken Whiteley Gospel Brunch. It is a great idea to see Ken Whiteley whenever you can. Gospel brunch, even better. So uh, that's happening on the Sunday. And then on the 21st, look up the music of Paul Corrington. Now, if you go around town a lot, you know Tony Corrington, the great uh, guitar player, award-winning uh, uh, producer, uh, composer. Well, his brother, Paul Corrington, was also seriously talented and busy. Paul wrote whale music. He won a ton of awards. Uh, when he wasn't an author, he was a very prolific songwriter like his brother, and uh, we lost him. But when he died, I saw him just before he died, he was absolutely amazing. He was working on a million projects. Uh, Martin Worthy said he took uh, a death march and turned it into a parade. Amazing guy. So pay tribute to Paul Corrington on the 21st at Hughes Room Live. Jazz Bistro, tonight and tomorrow, Richard Whiteman has a CD launch. Harold Danko is playing piano. 
and Richard Whiteman, who's known as a pianist, is playing bass. And he's been playing bass a long time. He's a real bass player. Uh, he has to be, because he's playing with Terry Clark. And on saxophone, Pat LaBarber. So what an amazing show. Jazz Bistro tonight and tomorrow. Harold Danko's super famous, and I tell you, you probably want to get reservations ahead of time to make sure you can get in. Uh, Denise Leslie is there on Sunday at 7 p.m. She's got a CD launch. I love the fact that one of the songs on her new record, it's a reminiscing. Remember that Yacht Rock classic? I love her version of that. Uh, Ron Davis is there on Tuesday on the 21st. Okay, this is something uh, that's new to Jazz Bistro, but they have huge big screens. So they're going to end a hundred and... $20,000 Steinway pops. So Ron Davis is going to play the piano to Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin and uh, he is fantastic and that's going to be a ton of fun. Katie George uh, is hosting the Jazz Jam on the 22nd. Katie George is going to Buble out of here or crawl out of here. Okay, that sounds weird. But she is going to be a superstar. Everybody loves her. The way she sings is just a little bit more special than most jazz singers. Uh, she's got that at Onita O'Day comfort zone uh, where she can just rip it and make it look effortless. So you want to see her. She's bringing a young band. She's hosting a jazz jam. So 10 bucks to come down and see the show. Five bucks if you want to bring a horn or get up and do something. Uh, it is a jazz jam, not an open mic. All right. So there may be a few singers there, but this is definitely a jazz jam. Uh, on the Thursday, Jay Douglas is going to be there with his blues band. I saw him in Markham with the same band, and man, it's every kind of music in one night. It is so much fun. That's Thursday the 23rd, and uh, next week at this time, Genevieve Marentette is doing the songs of 1969. All those great rock pop songs, all reimagined as jazz tunes, as only Genevieve Marentette can. Gigi, as we call her. So all of that, jazzbistro.ca. Make dinner reservations to ensure that you get a good seat. And now, we're going to talk to Ernesto Cervini about his crazy busy life. Mister, thanks for coming. Hey, let's see your hand. Ay, ay, ay. So how'd you do that? Skating with my son. Oh, skating. Yeah. yeah. Skating is dangerous. It is. Although I took him a bunch last year, and I never fell. And yeah. then uh, we were playing shinny, and I don't know. I was. We were fighting for the puck, and we both went down, and I didn't come up as fast as he did. <laughs> He's right. Can't stand <laughs> yeah. you. Um, hey, so you're a drummer. What do you do when you have a, uh, a broken heart, wrist? Rest. Just rest. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to... I'm I'm not doing anything for a couple of weeks, and then I'm gonna start just playing with my left hand, and and I I don't know I don't know yeah I don't really know I canceled a bunch of gigs, and uh, and then just take it easy. So the first thing when I hear of a musician who gets seriously injured and can't play music, I right away think of Unison Fund, mm -hmm. um, uh, a great benevolent fund for musicians. But you are able to work, just not playing drums. Yeah. Um, one of the things I want to talk to you about, and we'll get to drums for a whole bunch, talk about music, but Orange Grove Publicity, my God, you guys are busy. Can you describe what it is you do to someone if they were about to... Uh... Sure. So Orange Grove, Grove Publicity basically does like CD release campaigns. So if you have a new album and you want to get it out to ra radio and press across the globe, um, then that's what we do. We would take your album and then help you prepare all the uh, stuff that you need to, to sell it, basically. And then uh, we'd send it out and try and get airplay and reviews and all that good stuff. So you created this company. What, what gave you the kick in the pants to do it? The idea is easy, but yeah. to actually get it done, you have to create a list that is a mega list. Yeah, so I started working on it when I did my first album. Uh, I didn't have any money to hire a publicist. So was I it your every... first quartet album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I didn't have any money, and I was living in New York at the time, so I had lots of time, uh, but no money. So I did all the publicity myself. And because I had so much time, I just sat down and, did, and researched a lot. And uh, never with the plan to start a publicity company, just because right. I wanted to get my album out. Yeah. So I'd look up like other people and where they were getting radio play or where they got reviews, and I was looking up... Uh, you know, radio stations that play jazz across the globe and, and getting their information on the internet. You can find anything, right? This was the turn of the century, the early 2000s? Yeah, it would yeah. have been, yeah, I forget when, when Here came out, but it would have been oh, 2005? Two, yeah, five or six, yeah. 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 So, um, so, yeah, I started developing these lists, and then uh, I hired a publicist 
um, a couple years later, and I wasn't very happy with the results, and I kind of... Was that the second record, 2009? was Little Blackbird, yeah. Yeah, 2009, yeah. yeah. And I thought, okay, I, you know, I think, I think maybe I should, I could do this. And, uh, but then I didn't think anything of it, but I think I said it to enough people that, uh, then Johnny, um, and, and, uh, the Hiltz, um, Sorry, the Griffith Hills Trio right. was, was my first client. So they uh, got in touch with Johnny got in touch with me. That was said, a fun record they yeah, made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got great, it. It was a great album. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they got in touch with me and said, you know, we, we're doing this album. We want you to be our publicist. And I kind of went, okay. I keep saying I could do it, so I may as well try. Right. And, uh, and we did a really good barter. So Johnny helped me with my website and set up my logo for me. And, and uh, I did their campaign for pretty cheap yeah and uh, because I, t I said listen I'm learning so right I'm this do may or may not work yeah but. and if it doesn't work I don't want you know because it's I have to be really careful I'm dealing with all of my peers the, my, my clients are also my peers and like I play music with Johnny <laughs> right you <laughs> like, can't be I, messing I, around no, yeah. it's, I have to be really really careful because uh, I can't afford to make any mistakes um, so yeah so it started kind of Small and and I think the first year I did maybe three campaigns and then the next year I did a couple more and then and then it quickly snowballed. Do you have employees? I do. Yeah. So Dan Fortan, who great bass player, great bass player, is also my right hand man. And yep. then um, we have a, a vo wonderful vocalist in the city named Jenna, Jenna Marie, mm -hmm. and uh, she's our social media guru. So she does all the social media for for us and for our clients. You still believe in sending sometimes, not always, because sometimes you send it out electronically, but yeah. you also sometimes send out CDs, mm -hmm. actual CDs. A lot of people still prefer it. A lot of, a lot of. I know I do, but I, I'm surprised other people do. I know I do. I, yeah. If I like a record, I want to keep it forever. Yeah, and a lot of people want to feel it and touch it and read it, and, and I kind of get it, you know, and and they want to see it in a shelf, not just on a computer. But they want to actually. Right. You know, before they do their show, go look at a shelf and say, okay, I'm going to pick that one and that one and that one. And they see the spine. I have some guys who will send me angry emails when I send them the CDs that are really thin and don't have a spine. Yep. <laughs> they send me these angry emails. Yep. I, go, I need to make a new, I need to burn it to another one and take an old jewel case and make a spine for it. Yeah. Well, well, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. It's not my CD. That's right. I do believe if people are going to make CDs, going a little above yeah. and making the packaging awesome yeah. is a better reason to buy it. But I agree. sales are down, but right? It's hard, and it's hard because a lot of I have a lot of musicians who come to me and say, "Do I need to make physical copy?" And I always, I mean, I always tell them, "Yeah, you absolutely do." Because um, for any send out that I do of a new album, I'm probably sending around 180 to 200 physical, and I'm sending about maybe 80 to 100 digital. So if you don't do physical, you're cutting out two thirds of the people that I can contact. Right. Because they just won't take digital. So. I I'm guessing the reason is they want to see the commitment to that someone spent some money and, and is proud of something yeah. and really went to that effort, right? Yeah, I think so. And then I think it's also just, I think it's a, an issue of also a lot of the people who do radio and press for jazz are older and they're used to CDs. Right. You know, and that's what they want. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, so when someone sends me something, if I don't know them, okay, I'm in radio, you send me something, it comes from Orange Grove. I'm going to listen to it. Right. If it comes from somebody in Nevada uh, that I've never heard of, right. And um, you might not even know who I'm talking about, but anyway, I get a million <laughs> records from this company in Nevada, and they're not even jazz records, and right. I feel bad because yeah. they're se sending me CDs, and I'm saying, please stop, I don't need this landfill, it's not, I can never play this music, right. and I was under the impression that she was probably charging them five bucks a pop for every record she sends out, right. making a profit of two dollars or two fifty. And right, then not, right. not caring whether it's listened to because of the amount. Right. With you, your numbers, if it's 180 globally, that's a very realistic number. Yeah, I try and keep it, I try and keep it uh, to the people who are getting results. So I'm not going to send it to radio stations who aren't going to play it. Mm -hmm. And I also pay attention to what, uh, with, with some DJs, they've told me, like, I like really modern stuff. So anything that's straight ahead, don't bother. Or there's other people say, I only like straight ahead. So anything that's not straight ahead, don't bother. Or I have people that say only singers. 
and others that say no singers. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. so I keep track of that in my databases so that I'm not wasting anyone's CDs and money and, and time. time and reputation. Yeah, because yeah. not only for the client, but also for all these radio stations and uh, for the press that I'm dealing with, I want them to know that I respect their time. And just like you're getting all these CDs that you have no interest in, it's annoying, right? Yeah. I don't want to be annoying. I feel bad for the artists. <laughs> right. I, I, I really, really only feel bad for the artists. I don't feel bad for the publicist getting it wrong. Right. I feel bad that the artist is wasting their money right. and that I'm not going to be able to help them in any way. Right. And the other is some people send you stuff with too many buttons. Yeah. Like you have to press here, press here, download here, listen yeah. here, and it should be as simple as, simple as possible. Because right? you get so many emails every day that, that you have to, you know, if you read any of these um, books about business or about promotion, it always says, like, keep your first email really simple, really straightforward. Like and maybe don't even ask for anything in the first one. Just right. say hello. And right. Like, so yeah, I usually have you know a SoundCloud link and a download link, very clearly labeled, and that's it. How much of your time does this Orange Grove take? It's really hard to quantify because it's kind of constant. So I'm working on it um, all the time, but it, in little spurts. I mean, I have it. The, the beauty of hiring someone to do this for you, besides their relationships that they have, is that something that if you did on your own would take you, you know, hours and hours. I have the machine set up, so when I have a new client, it's all like pretty streamlined, so I know exactly what I need to do in what order and when. Stuffing CDs in padded envelopes and shipping them out. Yeah. Following up a certain amounts of times. And, yeah, and yeah, exactly. Getting doing reports. All the prep. Actually, the biggest job is doing all the prep before the campaign starts. Just getting everything to uh, creating the individual databases for that specific client. Um, and then, you know, I mean, this stuffing the CD is the last of that whole prep part, like making yeah. a one sheet and making sure the intro emails look really nice and, and all that stuff. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know. I probably spend, I don't know, at least a couple hours a day. Yeah. Are there artists you don't? Represent? Are there people that have sent you records that you go, I don't think I can work on this one? I Yeah, there have been. I think if it if it doesn't fit within kind of the musical um, uh, breadth of what Orange Grove has worked on and is working on so far. I mean, mostly we're doing modern jazz. So, now not only that, but like I don't have as many contacts in, let's say, world music. Or, um, or you know, if something is super traditional it may not really so I, I right I noticed the music you put out on Orange Grove is stuff that I imagine you would want to listen to or even play on it right. does come from the same world yeah 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 and I try and keep it also because that's better for the company and better for all the people that I'm sending it to because they see Orange Grove and they know right. what it's going to be. And every once, I mean, I've had people say, I'm not going to get a wonky cabaret toe deaf vocalist or yeah, something. Yeah, like they'll that. say, I opened this one and I didn't know why you sent it. And I'm always like, yeah, I should, I should maybe not have, you know, maybe that was a, a mistake taking that client because it didn't really fit. Yeah. Um, but it's also, you know, it's hard to say no to people. I want to give everyone the opportunity to have their music heard. Right. So it's hard. It's really hard to. Right. But if you don't think you can help them enough, you'd be just no, saying you probably yeah. want somebody else. Yeah. Who's got a yeah. And I have. Face. I've definitely said that before. Yeah. Um. And I also I have a, we have an Orange Grove DIY package that we do for people. This is fascinating. Yeah. I have never ever heard of a company doing this. Tell, yeah, tell yeah, everyone yeah. what this so, is. So so what it is is it's basically I put together a step by step instructional kind of. PDF that explains how you do the whole thing yourself. So it costs way less than hiring Orange Grove. Um, you can still use the fact that you've, you're you working with Orange Grove, but you do all the work yourself. And it's not on your stationery and it's not coming from your yeah, office, right? Yeah, so, so... So they can buy basically like a mailing list and a bit of a how-to, the guide on a, what a you're supposed to. A full how-to, yeah. yeah. It's really in-depth with like samples and... Um, and yeah, the databases and, you know, I, I go as so far as to explain like which um, emailing program I use to do mass emails and like which envelopes I use and how much it should cost. Because some people, if you don't know, and then you go to the post office and they're like, oh, okay, so you need to put a customs form on each one to the U.S. Right. Like, no, 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 you don't need to do that. So if they tell you that, 
take your stuff back, go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not then, true. Right. And it should cost you this amount. Good. You know, so um, what does a package like that cost? To the U.S., it's usually two eighty-five ish. With this, yeah, time. okay, so that's yeah. what I thought. Two to three bucks. Yeah, yeah. It, Canada's about one eighty-five. U.S. is two eighty-five, and Europe's about well, anywhere overseas is about six dollars. So a lot of people have that side nowadays. Young young people, especially, try to get their brain working on both sides so they can right. do their own promo. Yes. And a lot of older musicians absolutely do not want to be stuffing envelopes or yes. worrying about database. Yes. So do, most of the people I'm guessing that are that are buying this. Are, this kit yeah, are younger, that's right? kind of the idea. Is it's for people who, like me, when I started doing this, have more time than money. And How many so, people have taken this kit and started their own company and trying to compete with <laughs> Hopefully you? Hopefully none. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't heard of that I happening, mean, but I I realized when I did it that that was a risk. I mean, I get all the clients to sign an agreement saying that they're not going to share the lists and it's for one time use only. And but I. I, no, that doesn't you know, mean they will, but that's a good it, thing. It's honor system. Yeah, it's an honor system. And I'll know if they do, because yeah. I know my people. So right. I'll know right away. And I have, I, it has happened already that some people have shared the list, and I got in touch with them right away and said, listen, I know you shared the list. Um, and they're usually very appalled. Oh, my God, I didn't know. And that was before I had the contract. So now I have right. people sign a contract. It right. Says, Say, no, come on, guys. Like, if they need the list, is, let them come to me yeah, for the list. Like, I'm is, the one who built this thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's a so great just idea. Just kind of do it and then and then hope. I, I made the DIY thing, I don't know, like three or four years ago, and I sat on it for about a year because of that problem because I was afraid. I couldn't, I couldn't think, how can I, how can I do this and not kind of get taken advantage of or lose... You know, I've control. written a figure down on a piece of paper right now while you're talking uh -huh. to me. I want you to tell me how much is it does it cost for a DIY kit, and then I'm going to show my number and see if we're the same. Okay, so the DIY is 500 plus tax. <laughs> I had 2,000. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I oh should have my, my prices then. <laughs> you are an amazing guy. You are an amazing guy. Now let's get into music for a minute. I can't even believe that. What a great deal. Um, your first record, around 2006, I guess, three years later, uh, it was uh, Little Black Bird. Yeah. That one really hit me hard. Yeah. That was great. That was So that's the Ernesto Cervini Quartet. Quartet, yeah. Ever since then, I don't know if you're aware of this, every band that you have put out, and that's like about five bands, they're either trios or sextets. No really? fours or fives, no yeah. duos, every single album. I do like trios a lot. <laughs> you have a lot of trios. I want to go through a list of bands, and if you could describe kind of what it sure. is. Because I don't know anybody in more bands than you. And I know people that play as a session man on every band in the world. Right. But as a band leader or producer or a band that actually puts out records and tours, I don't know how you can do this. So Idiotech, mm -hmm. um, really, I have never met Terry Parker. I'm a huge fan oh, of her awesome. playing. Yeah. I just love her record. Um, so Idiotech is, is Radiohead. It's a yeah. six-piece band. It's, a six, it's basically a tribute band. Yeah. So like true, true tribute band. We're not, there's nothing jazz about this project. It's a rock band. It's a tribute band. We play like the Horseshoe. A bunch of jazz players. Yeah, it started play, out yeah. as all jazz players. It started out, uh, Don Scott, who's the the main singer in the band, uh, is a great jazz guitar player. And we were, I was at a party at his house and some Radiohead came on, on his playlist and a bunch of us were nerding out, listening to it, talking about how much we loved it. And we thought, oh, we should get together and just play, you know, play some songs. It'd be so much fun. And we did. And then we thought, oh, we should do this again. So we did. And then we thought, oh, we should get a gig at the Transact. It'd be so much fun. Just play some Radiohead for our friends. It'll be wicked. So we did. And then it was, you know, like, right. like it's Orange It's the Girl. love of music. It's yeah, kind of, yeah. It was very organic. And it just slowly snowballed into this thing that now it's, you know, now we can play for 500 people. A favorite Radiohead album? Album? Sonically. I, I think it's In Rainbows. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I love In Rainbows. I like what I loved about In Rainbows is to me it was almost like a compilation album. It's like it took everything they had done before that, and then it was a whole bunch of new music, but that was based on all of their like some of the songs sound like really early, and some of them are really electronic and sound really modern. And so it was just it was this incredible like cross section of everything they had done so far. And we actually do the whole album, so we do full album show where we'll just do. In rainbows. That's amazing. I thought you were going to say okay, not okay. 
Yeah, well, that's really good too. <laughs> but that's really obvious. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, then uh, let's go to uh, Tetrahedron. Yeah. Tetrahedron. Yeah. Luis Dennis, mm -hmm. fantastic sax player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Rich Brown, a monster bass yeah. player. Yeah, so, that, so this is electric bass. This is electric bass. So it's a kind of a different, more funky, more backbeaty type stuff. Um, but we do some swinging stuff as well. Uh, I played with Rich for the first time I, well, four or five years ago with Elena. And I, I just remember, um, you know, I knew who he was. I'd heard of him. I'd heard him play before. But as soon as I sat down and played with him, I thought, oh, I need to play with this guy more. And I played with Luis, I don't know, it's a certain, a, a little bit as well. And then um, I got a series of gigs at the Rex, like a weekly for, for a that month. That really is your training ground. That and Transac that. are yeah. your places, right? So I played, so I got a weekly gig there. So every week I just brought in a different trio of musicians that I like. So actually, I, I brought in that band and we played a gig. I brought in Toontown with Kelly, Jefferson, and Artie Roth. I put that group together for one of those. And so, and it kind of just stuck with me. You know? yep. And so with that band, as soon as we started, we played a couple gigs like that, and then I contacted the guys and was like, I think I want to make this a thing. Like, can we do this more? So did you, uh, but you put out a record, so did you, do you constantly have ideas, uh, I won't call them brain farts because they're way bigger than that, <laughs> but, but you, you have these ideas and then you actually have to write up a proposal and actually find a way to yeah, find the record. basically, I mean, I just, I think one of the things I do is I just try and pay attention. I pay attention to what works mm -hmm. and, and when I find something that works, I, I make sure I make note of it and I don't forget. And then when the time comes or when there's an opportunity, then I kind of grab it and run with it. So the Tetrahedron, uh, Anzic Records. Anzic Records, yeah. So we have a new album. That band has our first album coming out in March. Um, and uh, it features, uh, we brought a guitar player, so it's going to be a quartet. Oh, well, that's right. <laughs> and uh, Buck Nier, the Nier Felder, right? Yeah, Nier is coming. Nier came and recorded with us uh, last year. And so it's coming out in March. And uh, I'm really excited about it. It's, it's now really was that fun. so was that a factor, Ontario Arts Council? Where, where would you go to help that with funding for something like that? Both. Ontario yeah. and Factor. Yeah. yeah. Although that band was interesting because I got denied funding for that band like four or five times before before I finally got some. Wow. Yeah. And was it was it uh, because you brought Near in or you I had new know. songs? Or? I think it might have just been... The, I have no idea. Because you're mean, allowed to apply the same time for... for or, I mean, over again, right? Yeah. Or something. Yeah. So I just kept applying. I applied Canada, Toronto Arts Council, Ontario Arts Council. And then I think... When I got when I sent in the last Ontario Arts Council one, I remember thinking, okay, you know what? If I don't get this one, I'm just gonna wait. We'll just keep playing as a band. I'm not gonna worry about it, and then I'll try again later. And then I got it, and I was like, oh, I guess I'm making a record. Okay, yeah. cool. Now the same thing with Toontown. <laughs> Toontown. Kelly yeah. Jefferson, yeah, obviously a master of the yeah. sax, and Artie Roth, one of the most fearless and fun, yeah, maybe bass players I can yeah. imagine. Yeah, and I think the first time I played with both of them was in this. Uh, grouping it was and this was like 12 or 13 years ago Holy I was still cow. living in New York and Artie called me for a gig at the Rex and it was trio with him and Kelly and I was living in New York but I was like yeah I'll, I'll fly home to do that that will be great and uh, and actually Dave Restivo had recommended me to him because I, I wasn't really I wasn't living here yet mm -hmm. so I and, you know and when I moved to New York I was a student so no one really knew me but I had played a bit with Restivo so he um, he recommended me to Artie, and again, I never forgot that first gig and how much fun it was. Right. Now, and you're from here. Yeah. Then you went to New York. Yeah. How old were you when you went over there? I was 21. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's got to be fun. Legal amazing. drinking age, amazing. barely. Yeah. Yeah, I was <laughs> you're 21. You're barely legal in New York. <laughs> <laughs> I was 21, and I stayed until I was 26, and then I moved back. And that's the why you have Joel Fram and all these connections yeah, to musicians exactly. in the U.S. Yeah, and it, and it helps that my sister's still there. Yeah. So, um, you know, she's still working with all these great New York musicians, and so yeah. it helps keep the Servini name. That's true. <laughs> Amy, Amy's doing really Amy's, well down Amy's there. Amy's doing amazing. Uh, yeah. Turbo Prop, another six-piece. Yeah. Oh, my God. Abundance. I loved Rev, but Abundance, that record, uh, Adrian Ferrugia shines yeah. like... A, a master it's unbelievable yeah the sounds on that thing he's incredible yeah I love that band I, it's, it's it's really funny because 
Um, like when I talked to Adrian about it, he always he misses the quartet a little bit because he had more freedom, and uh, he's always like, "Oh man, I really miss the quartet. When are we going to do more stuff with the quartet?" But I just love turbo prop. I so I I love what I'm able to do having those three horns. Right. You know, arrangement wise, and and uh, they're just so good. Everyone in that, and it's so much fun. And that band really, and everyone you've really toured that loves band, right? each other. Yeah, we've toured. We've we've done Canada. Three and you probably save money because uh, obviously William Karn and uh, they, they can room together. Tara, right? Tara can room together. Tara can room together. Husband and wife are good. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's really fun. So we we always have a blast on the road. And we the last time we toured was, I guess a year ago now, uh, right after Abundance came out. Yeah. And um, now I need to. I've started writing. I have a couple. I think we have three new tunes already. So. I'm going to write some more and then make another album. <laughs> Here's one. Mem 3. I am a Pennsylvania great. I am completely confused. Yeah. Um, when I have a Mem 3 record and right next to a Myriad 3 record. Right. Two different bands you're in. Yeah. Both trios. Yeah. Both with the three in there. Yeah. So what happened? Mem 3 was uh, a group that started with two of my closest friends in New York. and But unfortunately, we started it like three months before I moved away from New York. <laughs> so so the project didn't, uh, it didn't really have a chance to grow that much. We made one album right before I left and, um, and then we kind of played a bunch and we wrote a bunch of new music and then we made another album about a year and a half after I moved back to Toronto. I thought I was still going back to New York all the time. I didn't have kids yet so mm -hmm. that was much easier. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so we made a couple albums, but then we really haven't played much since. Right. Um, Meanwhile, Myriad 3, Myriad, huge reviews, yeah, yeah, insane yeah. amount of fans from all around the world. That one must have almost surprised you, right? How yeah, much? It, was, it grew really fast, but it's also, all three of us are really committed to that group still. And um, so we, I mean, I think, how many, we've done four, did we do four albums in in like six years or yeah, something. It was yeah. really fast. And now. Chris Donnelly really came to people's attention because but I had seen him play solo piano yeah. and he'd already blown my mind. But yeah. to see him with you guys, yeah. you were called the bad plus of Canada. Right. Which obviously is stinting praise in some ways and major praise sure, in others. Absolutely. You have I mean, your own voice, yeah. you have your own ideas, but boy, that's a good band to be compared yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, obviously we've listened to them a bunch and we all really like the bad plus. Um, so anything like that, you know, absolutely, it's it's great. Yeah, you know? and Dan being one of your best friends. Dan, and, and that and a grew out of that player, too, right? though, right? Like, when we started, we were close, but we were all kind of, you know, I knew Chris from, we had been at U of T at the same time, and Dan and I just knew each other from kind of being on the scene. We never crossed paths in school, because he started at U of T the year after I left. So, right. so we just kind of knew each other from, whatever, being around. And then with that band, it just took off really fast. So I remember seeing Dan in different bands when he was very young. Yeah. And man, he could play. He could yeah. swing. Yeah. He could bop. But I think you released the monster in him. I think that, <laughs> that's, the band, that's the band where you guys went, went everywhere. Yeah. Like, talk about exploration. Yeah. Um, is that, was that band signed to a different label? We, we were on Alma Records. Yeah, we're yeah. On Alma Records. So... Yeah. So you work with a whole bunch of different labels when you make yeah, records. Yeah, well, Myriad has been on Alma Records since the beginning. Um, and then Anzic Records, I've done my quartet stuff and my and turboprop stuff with Anzic. Um, uh, just, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, you don't have to be totally um, with one label. I think uh, Toontown just released our album on Slam and Media. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, so right now I'm on three different labels, I guess. Um, and I think the idea is just that I, you know, you choose what's best for that band because they're not all Ernesto Cervini projects, right? Toontown isn't my band. It's a collective. It's our band. Yeah. And we decided that that would work really well for us. Myriad is not my project. It's all three of our projects. And we liked, we loved working with Peter and Alma Records, and Chris already had a great relationship with him. Right, and, and he so and, and great... Peter at Alma only picks a handful of bands. Oh, it, he it, does it, not overfill his plate. Absolutely, and it was an amazing opportunity for us. Yeah. Um, and then Anzic Records is run by um, Anat Cohen and Oded Levery, and Oded is my brother-in-law. 
So it's kind of cool. like a family. Yeah. It's kind of a family. And label. then slamming are really all over the place. Uh, yeah. I mean, I see posts and things everywhere all the time. And they're amazing at social media, and they they have a really good. They're getting a really good distribution presence and stuff. So it that for that band just seemed to make sense. So and I had been working with some of their other uh, roster of artists as a publicist. So that's how I knew of them. And so then it just seemed like that would be a good relationship. This is what's so amazing about the jazz scene in particular. Music industry in general is yeah. pretty interesting right now. Yeah, you yeah. got to come up with some new ideas or you're yeah. going to starve. Yeah, but, for sure. But with jazz, you're able to do this. This is mm. Everything you're doing is completely 21st century. If someone would have told me years ago that you're going to have a label assigned to three different labels, doing your own publicity, working for them, them working for you, and right. you're going out and getting a brand new label. Right. It just sounds <laughs> insane. Yeah, it, it is a little <laughs> insane. But it, it's it's kind of just, again, it all kind of happened organically. And uh, and so, and I know, you know, I'm very above board with, with all the different labels, letting them know what's going on and making sure they know. So I'm not... I don't want to make any you're touring angry. with this band at this time, yeah. but you're open for this other band at this time. Exactly. Um, you have been up for so many awards, a nominations of the Yin Yang. But I did see a picture of you accepting the Haygood Hardy yeah. Award. Tell us about what is that? So it's from SoCan, and it was uh, it's for jazz composition. And uh, so, I, I to be honest, I didn't. I don't know how I got it in terms of um, like who nominated yeah, you. Yeah, there's no application process. I just got an email one day saying congratulations. And I went, what's the Hague? What? <laughs> I don't know anything about this. So, uh, so it was amazing. It was a really nice honor. People and who think Hagen Hardy only did the homecoming don't know the depth of yeah, that musician, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it was great. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I think it was based basically for my writing for Turbo Prop. Yeah. And, um, but it was a huge honor. Yeah. Right. So. Oh. Well, you deserve way more awards. You're doing amazing work. I can't believe your kid is $500. I'm probably going to buy one for myself or a New Year's gift or something. Um, so you have coming up. I mean, Toontown is very new. Yeah. I've been playing it on Jazz FM. Great record. Thank you. Um, uh, but coming up in March 2020 with the Near Fielder. Tell, yeah. tell us one more thing about that. So record. yeah. So it's uh, it's you know it's a more kind of electric backbeaty album it's what does it have four originals and then a couple uh, a tune by rich and then a couple covers one standard and um and and the name it's tetrahedron is the name of the album oh the album as yeah. well as and the it's band just, and i'm the it's just my my name is the artist yeah. it's tricky when you have your own like it you know is it is it is the artist going to be ernesto Servini's tetrahedron or is it going to be just ernesto Servini? it's, it's the same with turboprop i don't I don't always know how to... It's important for branding to have your name somewhere because there's a level yes. of trust with you. Yeah. Even Gene Donovi, yeah. the 90-plus piano Dunovi. player, <laughs> sings your praises. And he's the one who told me you play clarinet and piano, not just drums, which yeah. is insane. Uh, we, we don't need to go there. But anyway, uh, yeah, you, you have a reputation, so putting your name on something is a great idea. Yeah, well, I think it's important, too, because it is my baby. Like that, it's I'm the one who put it all together, and yeah. um, so... Um, but it's just finding the way to, to, you know, again, it's like fitting it in the box. You have to make sure you fit it in the right box so that everyone knows what's what it what. is and to pick it up. Exactly. And how do you juggle your fatherhood with, uh, you've got two kids, a great yeah. wife and yeah. a company and a whole bunch of gigs and some tours and teaching, teaching too, <laughs> teaching, I'm teaching what? at U of T and Humber as well. So, um, it's, I, I you got to update your website. I think I missed that one. <laughs> Holy Maybe cow. Maybe I didn't put it in there. Holy yeah. cow. Uh, I think, I think. The juggling the parenthood is the hardest one, to be honest. That's the hardest because that's a full time, one hundred percent full time gig, and uh, you want to make sure that you're, you're not like when I get distracted and I get grumpy about an email that came in, and then I you know take it out on them, and it's not fair, you right? Because they didn't. They, now sometimes they deserve it because they're sometimes <laughs> yeah. sometimes they're a pain, but you know. It, so I think that's the hardest part is juggling all that stuff. When and, people tell me I'm busy, I always tell them, yeah but I don't have kids. Right. I understand busy. <laughs> Being a parent is way busier than anyone can throw stuff at me and I'll go, well, I'll have a nap whenever I want and right. no kid will wake me right. up. Right, yeah, it, it does make you, it has for me, put stuff into perspective a lot better um, and it also taught me about time management and just right. being able to, if I have 15 minutes, really use those 15 minutes. If I have something I need to get done, then I can carve out a tiny bit of time to do it, but I need to, 
do it. So, yep. you know, oftentimes people will, I, I always feel kind of bad because I feel a little bit like a snob because people are like, oh man, I was watching this great show and you should you should check it out. I'm like, I don't really watch TV. <laughs> I, don't know. No. I honestly don't I, have time. You imagine binge watching? I don't, I'm going to watch four episodes I of don't. one show at night. I really want to watch... Um, <laughs> Uh, Maisel, Miss Maisel, we watched. Do you have you watched that? No. Oh, it's on Amazon Prime. What is mm. it? Magnificent Miss Maisel. Anyways, mm. it's an awesome show, and I watched the first season with my wife, and then the second season is out. The third season is out now, and we just haven't had time in the past year to sit down right. and watch it. Exactly. But we are finding time. We've we've been rewatching all of the Harry Potter movies, so we do have our priorities. So <laughs> we just right. watch them in like forty minute chunks at the end of the night after the kids are in bed before we pass out. Right. And watch a little bit of Harry Potter and then, okay. You know what they say, and this is the most true saying of any old adage, is if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Right. Not to the person who's whining about not having any work and not right. doing anything. Give it to a busy person. They're already on a roll and they're not going to let you down. Right. That yeah. makes sense. Well, like thank that. you. Thank you. <laughs> you are a busy person. <laughs> thank you very much, James. Thank you, Ernesto. All right, coming up next week, Stitch Winston. We'll hear from Stitch Winston. Uh, that's going to be uh, next Friday at this time, whatever time this is. And, of course, if you're online, who cares? Uh, this will be on forever and ever. This may not be uh, the 17th of January. Anyway, Happy New Year once again. I say that for the entire month of January. We'll see you next Friday.